Hey everybody, welcome to the show. Um, hey Phil, thank you guys for joining us. Let's see if we can hear everything. Sounded good. Let me kill the volume here on that stream. There we go. Okay. Awesome. Great. Give everybody a minute to kind of get in here. So uh, today I thought uh, we would talk about double stops because I haven't done much country stuff in a while. And I know I think I'm, I'm kind of annoying some people. They're like, yo, this is what you do on True Fire. Come on. Um, but um, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to do a little lesson on, on double stops. And I'm, I'm going to talk about, well, a couple things. I'm going to play over... Um, a track from the Country Guitar Survival Guide for Lead, which was one of my really early courses, but I redid the track for the double stops. Back then, what we were doing is we would, you know, play a solo example, and at the end, rather than keep the loop going, uh, the metronome would kick in again and count you back in at the top of the solo. And I knew it was super annoying for anyone who was looking to just kind of jam over the track. Um, so I went back today and I remixed that and kind of made a nice loop for that. So that is in that uh, tab and uh, notation link. You can go grab that. Also, if you don't own that course, that's totally cool. The um, tabs for that solo and the solo that I'll be talking about today is also in that link, um, along with a bunch of other links down there. Uh, link to the course is down there. Link to my channel, The Speakeasy. Tips if you, you're feeling it, no pressure. Um, and, uh, of course, like the subscribe for the YouTube channel and all that good stuff. Um, so I'm going to show you that solo just because it's filled with a bunch of licks that are all in a position. Um, and I'm going to talk about trying to play things in a position. And then I want to give you like a little bit of um, some practicing, you know, some exercises to do to start really seeing these shapes and be able to kind of make up your own double stops rather than always relying on classic double stop licks or you know waiting around for new ones to pop up so all right so first um first i'm going to play this solo and i'm going to talk about some of these licks and the uh you know playing in position and everything um and then um and we'll get into some exercises and then you know we'll do questions and normal hang thing when we have time uh, quick close. Hey, Sam. Hey, Robert. I see Graham. Thank you guys for coming and hanging out. Appreciate it. Um, appreciate it. Here we go. So I'm going to bring up this track. And uh, I just went back and relearned this today. It's been a while. So, uh, you know, hopefully uh, hopefully we'll be, we'll be all right here. <laughs>
So that first time through, uh, I was playing the solo from the uh, Country Guitar Survival Guide, uh, the first double stops exercise. And I want to break it down. And this is a great forum for just opening up for you guys to ask questions about this stuff too. So first, let me talk through the progression and then I'll talk through what I'm thinking when I'm playing over that. So the progression is kind of, kind of loosely based on Vince Gill's Liza Jane. Uh, I'm a giant Vince Gill fan. I think he's fantastic as a songwriter and guitar player, of course. And, um, so it's got a this progression in there that I kind of lifted from from that tune. So here's the progression. So we're hanging out on G. I think we're doing let's see like eight bars of G there. Um, and then the thing that I kind of lifted from Liza Jane was going up a minor third. So I'm going from G to B flat. So you have a flat three chord that's major up to a four chord back to a one chord and then second time I keep climbing I'm on G I go to that flat three major chord four and all the way up to the five and then the percussion uh, starts over again so here's what I'm visualizing there's a, a million approaches to double stop there's just tons of ways to come at it and they're all of them are you know worth checking out and doing for sure it just all kind of informs you know, your knowledge of the fretboard. But here's one approach to try to play these things in a position. So the first thing that I'm doing is kind of visualizing this G bar chord. Uh, I know a lot of people are gonna scream cage system right away. I don't really think cage system, I know there's like a legit cage system. I don't really think about it much. Um, I definitely use chord shapes as kind of templates or visual indicators. Um, especially when you're at a certain level, they can be super, super helpful. Um, and then you just have to learn the neck more to kind of transcend that. But so I'm kind of looking at this G chord shape here for the B flat chord. I'm looking for the closest shape and there's a, uh, B flat chord there. It's kind of keeping me in position. Root five, root three. You can put the third down here if you want. I could look at this kind of in partials too. I could look at the bottom half like this, and I could look at the top like like that or like this. Okay. Um, for the C chord, pretty classic C bar chord there. But I'm also looking um, the top two notes there. I'm also looking for the third here. I'm also looking at the root and fifth down there. So I'm really trying to make sure I'm seeing that that all those notes of the C chord in that position. And then the last chord is the D. I'm using that kind of C shape. But again, I'm looking at this in partials. This covers, of course, five strings, but on the bottom here, I might visualize that. I might visualize three strings, or these three, or these three, or these three, or two at a time. So that keeps me all in position. Uh, now what I have to do is get comfortable changing. So maybe the first thing you wanna do is just get cozy switching between those chords. So just running through those shapes. And you could do it in order of the progression. You get that in your hands. There's two really super common approaches that are just universal and you're probably sick of hearing me talk about them because I talk about them all the time, um, but they they show up everywhere. And it's the half step approach underneath a chord tone, and a diatonic step approach from above. Um, so one gives you a really nice uh, tension from under underneath, and the other one almost acts as like a suspension, a resolving suspension. So first thing I like to do is go through and group all these um, double stops in two strings at a time. Uh, two strings right next to each other at a time. So I'm gonna grab the first two strings, the E and B string, and I'm just gonna come down, grabbing. Now I'm grabbing with the pick and middle finger, and there's two ways I do this, but this is what I would start doing. Now I don't wanna miss out on that third and fifth, so. So I might come across here and grab this, and might come down here and grab 
that root in third. Or I could do it like this. Those are all pretty in position. We're a little loose with position playing, but it's this area of the fretboard. You know, we get as close as we can. So after you kind of do that with the middle finger and the pick, go back and do it with the ring and middle finger. So you're really grabbing and getting a nice kind of spanky sound. I would do that with each chord. You go to the B flat, you know, here you could break it up into partials. If you want to grab the third and the fifth, you could do that there. You could go. For the C. Come across here to grab that third and fifth jump out of position so you know the shapes get you close but you still want to jump out to grab some of those intervals that don't exist in those chord voicings and then for the D I'm gonna get down here grabbing that low five on the bottom so go through and you can run just up and down like that with the uh, pick and middle or with the um, ring and middle and what I would do is bring this, if you've never done these things or, you know, you know a couple licks, but you really haven't built a lot of strength doing this, then what I would do is I would do this with a track. And it's, it's just more of a conditioning thing just to get comfortable moving, switching the chords, playing this stuff in time. And I'll show you what I mean. It doesn't even have to be super rigid, but I'll show you here. You go to quarter notes too. Jump to that D a little bit early. So just trying to move up and down doing that. If you get comfortable with the, you know, quarter notes there, or the actually half notes, go through and see if you could do quarter notes. Um, just getting strength here, getting quick, trying to get even attacks. It helps the right hand a lot. All right, now let me jump back to what I started with um, and then went off on a little bit of a tangent, uh, which is a half step approach. So with all those little double stops that I was doing here, I'm gonna take uh, any of those intervals and I'm gonna drop down a half step and approach into them. So instead of playing that, I'm gonna come down a half step and move up to it. I'm gonna do that with each one of these. Okay, and then of course you want to do that with all the shapes. You got the B flat. Got that C. Uh, brain fart and the D. Okay, and that's another thing that you might want to bring up the track and give a shot doing. Here we go. Okay, it's not the sexiest thing in the world. It's not super cool. Um, but what it is, is it's a conditioning exercise. It's a way to get you to see these things, get you to hear them, um, get you used to changing. We're just on a path here. We're just trying to build strength, trying to build up our knowledge of where all these things are. And you just have to kind of accept that, like, you know, it's not going to sound great right away. So if you're trying to get that level of freedom with moving through these things, these are just kind of the growing pains of it. So, all right. 
So now after you kind of do those half step approaches, you want to incorporate the diatonic approach from above. So that just means a scale note from above. So back to those top two notes there, that D and G, I would just go a scale note above each. So G would be an A and up a scale tone from uh, uh, D would be E. Okay, so then I have my diatonic approach from above. If I'm down here on B and D, approach from above, the B would be C, the D would be E. From the G and B, it would be A and C. And then we're down an octave now from where we started, so the D and G would be E and A. And then the uh, B and D would be C and E. And then A and C. So now we have... Okay, another thing you would bring up the track and... When you get to the B flat, you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna look at that shape. Um, and not think in the key of B flat. Make sure that you're thinking in the key uh, of G mixolydian for this. So when I go up a whole step, uh, I'm actually playing an E natural, not an E flat. So. And you do the same thing for the C. And then for the D. It's a lot of kind of tedious work, but like I said, if you want to get to that point where you're really able to move freely through all this stuff, you kind of have to do it. And heck, it's like a great way to, you know, get inside the fretboard anyway. So, all right. So... Um, let me know if you guys have any questions as I'm going along. If I move past anything a little too fast, just, you know, let me know. I'm kind of glancing over here as we go. All right, so now we get to where we're doing something cool. We're going to combine these two things, this half step underneath to a diatonic step above, and then finally resolving at our destination. So I went a half step underneath that D and G, and then I skipped it, went a diatonic step above, and resolve down to it. Now I could have also flipped that and went diatonic step above to a half step underneath and resolve. So now it's starting to sound like something that's like, ah, oh, that sounds kind of cool. Now we're sounding like we're using double stops and it sounds useful. So now when you start putting the right hand stuff in there of chicken picking along with it and grabbing these um, and changing up the rhythms and incorporating all those compositional devices that we talk about a lot here in these YouTube lives, you start to get something that sounds really cool and, and pretty musical. And you could sit down and just with that information alone, you could start to write out a ton of your own double stop licks out of a shape. Okay, so there's another thing that I'll do is I'll add chromaticism. So if I'm, say, going from here to here, I might take this whole double stop and chromatically walk it down. I might take one of the notes and walk it down. Okay, so there was taking just the bottom note. And then resolving, or I could do that with the top note. I could walk into this from a whole step underneath. Okay, so I would try that with each one of those chord shapes. And if you find licks that you're writing, uh, making up that sound really good, you know, keep a practice journal and just mark them down. Like cool lick out of this shape, write it out, you know, start to build a little arsenal of ideas. 
that's kind of what I did for a lot of this stuff because I didn't want to get as much as I love all the classic double stop licks and I'll, I'll break that solo down for you in a second and show you a bunch of those things that I was doing. Um, I wanted to be able to do those, but I also wanted to be able to make up my own, um, and just have, you know, a little bit more freedom. I want to be able to kind of improvise and, uh, make up my own licks on the spot. So I knew the only way to do that was going to be to go through all this stuff in a really kind of tedious way, uh, to kind of open up my hands and my ears and my eyes to seeing all this stuff so I could grab it in the moment. All right. So let me see if we have any questions here before I talk about that solo. No, everyone's got it. All right. <laughs> um, thank you, Phil, for posting here. I appreciate it, man. Um, Phil's posting about the uh, UA videos, which, uh, man, I'm so psyched to do because I really like UA's stuff, and I use... I use all their plugins long before this, and I use them, um, you know, to mix records and to record, and and for things like this, it just makes life so much easier. Oh my god. Okay, uh, Hunter, a little rough summary. All right, yeah, cool. I will. So first, go over all these shapes in a position. Maybe practice switching practice seeing all those things the next thing that you want to do is go through the shapes two strings at a time first with pick and middle finger grabbing and then go through again with uh, middle finger and ring so you get build up strength on that The next thing you want to do is start to incorporate the half step approach. Okay, and then you want to go back and work on the diatonic approach from above. And then combine those two things. Okay, and then you could reverse it. I was going underneath to above and then resolving. So I could start from above, go underneath, and then resolve. I would do that with each shape. And that's a great exercise to do. Um, and this is just for trying to play in a position and really um, not trying to jump all around the neck. Um, we could do a whole other lesson about how I would open that up to the whole neck but this is what i would start with you know get get good at that it's going to make taking all those next steps much much easier um i hope that helps hunter uh, diatonic to the key the double stops and be flat yeah so i don't treat each it's kind of that's a good question uh no i don't treat each as its own tonal center completely so i am looking at that i'm looking at all the notes that are making it up but i'm also looking at the overall key of the tune like this is in g and i have the g major scale to use or if i'm going for more of a kind of rock and country thing like this i'm going to use more dominant sevens than normal so you know probably g major scale or g mixolydian scale uh the g mixolydian scale lends itself better here so except for when you're playing over the d but um that's why i chose e because i was thinking of the overall key of the tune if i went to b flat sometimes that would still work uh it would work better if it was a four or the five chord the fact that it's a flat three chord is going to make it sound a little bit weird so if i was doing uh you know It's a little too four to one. It's a little too plagal, you know, uh, stonesy, I guess. So if I wanted that sound in the moment, and I really wanted to do that, I, it's not like something that I'm opposed to doing. Um, I might do it, but uh, but generally for something like this, I it's it wouldn't be my first instinct to do that. So I would use the E natural, not the E flat. 
but that's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I love that. Pete. Okay, so Pete's asking about uh, using the seventh and the tritone. That is a double stop that I really do like using. I, I wasn't even talking about sevenths with this because I just feel like first steps, you should start there and get really comfortable with a half step and diatonic step approach. Otherwise, you're just drowning in a sea of options. So, you know, I, I don't want to overwhelm you with too many things. But what Pete's asking is about the third and the seven, which is a, a really cool thing. Those are also known as like guide tones. The third really tells you the quality of the chord. And the seven is letting you know that it's a dominant seven. So, and there's a lot of um, energy in those two notes. You know, so... Uh, especially over dominant, if it's actually acting like a dominant seven chord, that note really wants to resolve up a half step, and this note really wants to resolve down a half step. So you get. That's another reason that those notes are kind of uh, picked as guide tones, is because they they have a lot of momentum in in them. They want to go somewhere. So, yeah, with the tritones, I will come at those things from a half step below or a half step above. There's no diatonic thinking when I'm playing tritone. So I'll do things like uh, I might do So I'm grabbing tritones there in different octaves, the B and the F B and F, or F and B B and F, F and B There's that uh, half step above it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, well, one of those licks that I was doing in here actually had that in that uh, in it. The, uh, so there's one a half step approach. There's the F and B with a half step approach. And then I think I changed in that solo to this, but. B and F, and then to a D and G. F and B, I'm just flipping them to a G and B. Okay, that's really leaning heavy on that on that tritone, which it's a great sound. So if I'm doing approach notes to that, it's always half steps from above or below. I hope that that helps out, Pete. Uh, let's see here, Mike, on right hand technique, like anchoring the pinky on the body. Do you keep the middle and ring fingers together? I do. Like, uh, so with my right hand technique, this is actually not from anchoring this worn out. Thing. If, if you watch watching like old videos when I, you know, first got this guitar and old True Fire videos or performance videos, this looked like you know brand new, but uh, and I had no idea that I even had this habit until I got a guitar that had you know real nitrocellulose lacquer, really thin, um, and I could see like, well, I didn't even realize I do this. But what I do is um, when I'm flat picking a lot, uh, I think because I I worked a lot at. Uh, swing guitar and bluegrass trying to fix my right hand technique I used to be very much like an elbow arm player too much finger motion and I was having all these physical problems and it was just not working for me some people can do that and it works like it was not working for me so I had to change up my hand position and how I played and so when I do a lot of flat picking I'm actually like off the guitar and wrist bent and it's more this motion of the um you know, the rotation really of the forearm rather than this, or rather than the hinge of the, uh, you know, the wrist there. And doing that, it was just because I grow up my nails a little bit to play hybrid picking for Chet Atkins stuff. <clears throat> it was those nails just lightly rubbing on the guitar that whole time that just kind of wore that out. I know that doesn't answer your question, but I just want to make sure you don't think I'm like, I'm, I'm anchoring here. I don't. Um, I try to avoid anchoring all the time uh, because someone told me when I was young that if you're resting your hand on the guitar, you're killing a bunch of transients on the guitar. It's like, 
you know, having this nice live room and you're throwing a bunch of rugs in the live room and you're losing all this like high end information. So I stopped doing it when I was playing um, acoustics. And then, you know, when I got into like electric, I just, and I changed my wrist position, I was able to get off the top of the guitar. Uh, when I'm hybrid picking though, yeah, I'm closer to the strings. And this is now answering your question. I try to keep everything as a tight unit. So I'm trying, um, imagining like a rubber band, like around these fingers, at least these two, that's keeping them together and working as a unit. So I, and I try to be as efficient with my motion as possible. I don't want to waste a lot of motion here. So I don't want to come off the strings a lot. I don't want to flail with my fingers a lot. I want to keep them as this, you know, tight little group here. Um, and when I'm doing things like this, you know, I'm consciously trying to not move a lot. I'm trying to get a good slap out of the string, but I'm also trying not to like come far away or, you know, have the fingers not lined up. I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, you know, Hunter asked about Albert Lee. Albert Lee is you know, has some weird idiosyncrasies um, that, you know, it's just the way he plays and he's amazing. Is it, you know, for him, maybe it's become this thing that he feels like he could play faster with it. And I'm sure it works for him. It's obviously, he's like one of the most swinging, you know, country guitar players there is. It's like the thing that you could learn his licks all day, but he's got the most bouncy feel and that's the thing that doesn't get talked about enough about his playing is like his feel is amazing. His feel is just like he's got that bouncy swing guitar feel almost when he plays. And it's the thing that I think a lot of players miss out on. I'm always striving for it um, and failing next to him all the time. He's so, so good at it. But uh, he does a lot of things, too, where he actually uses his pinky for hybrid picking. And it's just I can't do that. It's it's I, I have long fingers as it is, so it would feel kind of cramped. But um I shouldn't say that. I've never worked on it, so who knows? <laughs> Just already making excuses for myself. Um, I've never done that, but I know Danny Gatton does that a little bit too. Um, everybody's got like little different things that they do, and you know you have to find things that work for you. There's definitely some general rules as far as starting points go. Um, you know, generally, like a lot of finger motion doesn't really work. Generally, you know, picking from your elbow doesn't really work, and you know, ergo ergonomically, that makes sense. Like, why would you have, you know, a joint and muscle group that's used to dealing with heavy lifting and big motion do something that's all this, like, fine motor motion and tiny little movements all the way down here? It just doesn't make a ton of sense. But then there's always going to be, be people that are just physically... Everyone's different from each other, you know? So some people, that's very easy to do. I've had some students come in and can just rip through alternate picking like 12 year old kids just like you show them alternate picking and they're just like immediately like tremolo picking you know super fast you know and hinging on the on the wrist here and you're just like well that's i can't do that that's not how i do that i have to do this do that another way um so you find what works for you and and you know just follow through with that and if something isn't working for you then you got to try something new. And when you do try something new, you got to stick with it for, you know, for a bit, I would say like a month or two, at least where you're doing it every day and you're really getting used to it and conditioning with it before you make the judgment call of, did this make things better or is it the same or is it worse? So it's an ongoing thing. Every guitar player I know is always thinking about and tweaking their technique, especially like their right hand technique. Um, okay. Do I always strive for emphasis or emphasizing the third of every chord change? Not always. Um, for the style of music that I'm playing, I do like to, you know, let people know about the quality of the chord. In other words, that it's a major chord. Uh, but am I leaning on it on purpose more than other notes? No. I think I'm, I'm hitting everything pretty, pretty equally. If anything, maybe the dominant seven probably more than anything else. <laughs> Maybe the dominant seven and the third, you know, I don't really think about it that much, to be honest. Um, let's see here. Uh, what about six? Yeah. 
Uh, oh man, I love that song. I don't want to spoil the party. Uh, that's a great tune. But uh, so working six. The nice thing about that that chorus, the survival guide that I did, uh, and I'm still really happy about that that chorus. Like I look back and I go, yeah, this is this is a a really good. Um, path to getting a lot of those techniques together it's not necessarily like here's stylistically what you should play or here's a um you know a bunch of improvisational games it's that whole course the survival guide for lead guitar is just to expose you to all the kind of techniques you're going to be using in country guitar and a lot of variations and then just etudes for shedding them just so you could kind of see what they do um but uh there's two Two sections? Yeah, there's two sections on sixes in there. There's a picking one and a bending one. And uh, that's exactly how I came at it when I was first learning this stuff. You know, you would learn some classic licks like... You know, or that thing. Um, and uh, my thing was, again, was like, I just... I don't want to lean on what everyone else does. And I'm sure I do a ton of things other people do, but... I wanted to just get freedom on the neck and I didn't want to lean on licks. So I just started working everything horizontally. So I would take, say, the key of G that we're in now. And I would take my sixes across here. And I would just start applying chicken picking techniques like... So over there I'm doing a playing the bottom note, dropping down a half step, coming up. And then popping the top note. And then I might walk up to it chromatically from a whole step underneath. And I just had, you know, probably 10 different ways I would embellish them. And I would do that on every set of two strings for sixes. So I use, you know, sixes and thirds are, you know, the two most common intervals you're going to come across in country music for sure. Um, let's see here. Um. Oh, I don't move my guitar pick when I finger pick Doyle. Um, I use it when I and I just you know. So I I, I don't tuck it in. I know there's some. I remember seeing a video where Brian Setzer was talking about he tucks it in. I don't do that at all. I just. You know, I still have three fingers here, and that's enough for if I have to do a little finger picking thing in the moment, um, or do Travis picking. You know, I could Travis pick with the thumb pick a lot, but if I'm on a country gig, I'm not bringing a thumb pick with me just for you know a little moment of Travis picking or a tune with, with Travis picking. So I just you know worked a while on getting Travis picking together with the pick. Yeah. Um. And I just got good at using pick and two fingers for that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I don't tuck it in or anything like that. Um, I don't have a back and forth thing. Yeah, Setzer's the... Yeah, there's a few people I see that do that, but um, I've never taught anyone to do that because I just... It just seemed like, you know, something that's not necessary, in my opinion. But, you know, to each their own. Um, okay, so, hey, I didn't even, like, break down this solo. <laughs> I'm I'm really psyched you guys asking a bunch of questions. Um and that's awesome. Uh but uh let me show you at least a couple licks in the solo before uh you know um we kind of get onto something else. But uh because some of these are, are kind of cool and hopefully we'll give you some insight. Um all right, so that solo opens up with I'm out of this G shape, and what I'm doing on the top two strings is I'm Hammering on to that flat seven, so I have the root on top, and then I'm doing a diatonic step approach, which also just happens to be a half step, but I'm not thinking half step right now. Um, up to that flat seven, so I have flat seven and G together. And then I have a muted pick stroke. And coming across again, this time the fifth is hammering on to the six, and I still have G on top. So I would call that a pedal. That note is pedaling up here on top. And the other cool thing about this that I should bring attention to is those muted pick strokes. Uh, muted pick strokes are an effect for sure, and it doesn't even matter 
if it's a, a muted note when you're at a fast tempo that even works in the key to be honest but um it's better if it does but sometimes you're going you know playing something so fast that it's not even really important it's more about the percussive sound of it and what it does it kind of acts as this placeholder for you to play something syncopated so without it i would have which sounds fine but if i put in that muted stroke it's just an, another cool bit of information um and it makes that syncopation even feel better Okay, a lot of pedaling on top of that G. The second half of that is holding that G and the D flat. So this is kind of coming out of the blue scale a little bit. So this is where I'm using pick and middle finger. Pick for that D flat, middle finger for that high G. And then pulling off down to that B flat. So pulling off again. And uh, then doing um, four flat three roots, a very minor pentatonic or blues scale-ish, you know. Really mixing major pentatonic and minor pentatonic. Um, the next lick is totally something I've lifted from Jerry Reed. Um, he does a variation on this uh, on the claw. And it's to start with that root come up and grab that double stop of the fifth and the root there on top playing that flat five in the root and doing that with pick and middle finger or ring finger and then coming across with that third finger so i get like kind of a c-shape so i'm thinking really that diatonic approach from above but what i'm going to do here is play that c and e down to a root, a lot of, again, a lot of pedaling. It could be on top. The pedaling G could be on the bottom here. And there's that half step approach. So here's my third and fifth, and it was a half step approach uh, getting into the third. Okay, just even that, in that, there's a lot of information, and, and hopefully, a, you know you'd be inspired by that just to start making up your own. Um, now I'm going to come down to the same thing, but down here on the fifth and root and octave lower. Same notes. And this time I'm going to chromatically walk that down. Open A, half step approach to the three. And there's a good example, too, of another one of those muted pick strokes to just kind of set up the syncopation. I mean, it's a muted E string. It's like technically that shouldn't sound good. But again, it's just you're barely hearing the pitch and up to speed. You don't even really notice it. OK, and then we get into that tritone thing that Pete was asking about earlier. So half step underneath the B and F, that tritone. So in tritone of the, it falls kind of into that G7 chord. Then playing the D and G. D and G here, D and G here, D and G there. And then doing that tritone again, this time it's inverted, so it's F and B, half step approach. And then G and B. And then I'm... Um, doing another half step approach, this time into the seven and fifth. So I'm continuing that idea. And landing on the seven and nine up there. Okay, so all that stuff in G uh, will sound like this. I'll do it slow. That was something I left out. Root and third go down to the seven and nine there. And then we play this again, down an octave with the chromaticism. Okay, so I want to answer a couple questions here because I see a bunch of stuff coming in. Um, let's see here. 
Uh, do I hang out on the rear pickup? Yeah. Um, you know, for uh, most most country music, I'm on the back pickup. I'm on the uh, the treble pickup. Get that nice bitey sound. If I'm playing, you know, within a solo, I can, you know, sometimes I'll jump back and forth style-wise. Like if I'm playing a country shuffle, I might start off with, you know... Then I might do... So I might, depending on the style of country music I'm playing, I might switch back and forth between a bridge and like a neck pickup if I want to go into Western swing land just for fun. Um... Phil, you put up a question here. Somebody was asking, what is Travis picking? Uh, we should just do a good intro to Travis picking or, you know, something like that in the future. Because that is a uh, rabbit hole for sure. But um, Travis picking is a uh, finger style technique that has been around for a long time. Um, but it gets credited to Merle Travis. But it was it was around for a while before that. You could hear Elizabeth Cotton doing it. You could hear Mississippi John Hurt. Obviously, um Merle Travis, and then the people that Merle Travis learned it from, like um, Mose Rager and uh, Ike Everly, um, two other guys from Muhlenberg County, Kentucky. Uh, Ike Everly, the father of the Everly Brothers, um, and one of the reasons that Chet signed the Everly Brothers to RCA, and also one of the reasons Chet produced all those records, because he had a close relationship with Ike Everly, from what I understand. Um I know he plays on a lot of those records too. So, and then they wrote a really nice uh, forward uh, for him on his record. I think it's on Teensville or Teen Scene. <clears throat> There's those two records that Chet did that are kind of like his rock and roll, early rock and roll, kind of, you know, in the tamest way possible uh, records, Teensville and Teen Scene, I think they're called. Um, and, uh, those are both great records, by the way. They're really fun. And I think uh, I think it's called Boo Boo Stick is the it's like I think that's like one of the first tunes with Wah Wah on it. And it's a passive Wah Wah. Uh, the the Armand Wah Wah, I'm pretty sure I haven't confirmed this, but I'm pretty sure because that was the only one around unless somebody made him something at the time. But uh it's really cool. It's like sweeping the tone knob on your guitar. It's not as extreme a filter that a regular wah wah pedal is, passive wah sound really really great. Um, but okay, so Travis picking is basically the idea is uh, that it's a guitar, uh, you know, kind of a guitar uh, version of stride piano. So if you think of stride piano, you have this you know bass chord bass chord bass chord situation going on, and then melody on top. Um, that's kind of what you're doing with Travis picking in a lot of ways. You're doing some kind of alternating bass note. And then that's something that stays constant and is a steady. And then around that, you're playing melodies. So, yeah, there's so much fun stuff we could do with that. Let's yeah, Maybe we'll do that next week. Maybe we'll do one on, on Travis picking. That'll be fun. Uh, the quick, let's see, asking about the muted triplet, chromatic triplet. Um, I wonder what I did that was a, I don't know what I played, uh, that had a muted triplet in it. This, oh, maybe this thing? Sorry, the, uh, is, was it that thing? Um, that's something that I got from, I think that's what you're asking about, but going through all these little triad inversions like that was again something I, I was doing to just learn the neck better years ago where it was just you know building triads off of each note in the uh, in the chord if I was playing over C7 I would have you know a C major triad and then I might do an inversion of it with the third in the bass 
I might do an inversion with, uh, you know, the fifth in the bass. It looks like a G minor. And so I'm getting all these extensions too, a B flat. Major triad would give me the flat seven, nine, and 11. And I think that's all I took it up to. I didn't really go up to a 13 very often. But I would go through and I would chicken pick those things. Just doing those triads. And then at some point, I started kind of rolling through them. And I'm going like pick, pick, middle when I do that. Doing... um. And then I would add a little approach note, so I had four notes, um, and then it felt like, you know, I was playing 16th, so I do, uh, let's see here. Maybe that was what you were asking about. Um, sorry if I don't totally understand. Um, let's see. Oh, man, Phil, I love Chet Atkins. Yeah. Big Chet Atkins fan, um, and I get my butt kicked by playing his tunes all the time. I'm always trying to learn more um, and, you know, love his whole approach to arranging and how economical he is and how much he embraces the guitar and, you know, just the keys that he cho uh, chooses to play things in. Um, you know, there's so much smart uh, arranging with Chet. Uh, and fun is just, you know, really lighthearted, fun music that is insanely difficult to play. It's it's always stressful to play when me and John Shannon have to play like three sets of Chet Atkins instrumentals. Because it also means, you know, three sets worth is it's a lot of tunes because they're all like two minutes long. <laughs> um, but yeah, Chet's, Chet's incredible. And I learned a lot from Chet. And you hear echoes of Chet everywhere. It's like Jimmy Page was a Chet fan. You know, where do you think in Song Remains the Same this lick came from? Right after the I Had a Dream uh, section of that tune, the verse. You know, that's like such a classic Chet thing to do. So, yeah, big fan of Chet. Um, anyway, so let's see here. Okay, I'm glad I answered. Oh, how I mute. Oh, okay, Sam. Thanks. Thanks for clarifying. It's sometimes hard to tell. Uh, but uh, for, for muting, yeah, with uh, the triplets, well, with any rhythm, I'll, you know, you think a lot of muting is coming from the right hand or the, you know, palm of the hand or the heel of the hand. And most of my muting, I mean, it's everything, to be honest. I'm using everything. But the majority of it is coming from releasing tension down here. So I'll give you an example. I'll just Because a lot of times I'm back right along the bridge. So I don't have, there's no way for me to mute, you know? So what I'm doing is just releasing tension here to get that muted thing. So that's what I'm doing for, for muting. Um, when I'm doing it with hybrid picking, like things like that, that's that's like kind of a James Burton thing where, you know, it just naturally happens. The notes just don't have time to speak. So I'm doing, well, with that lick, I'm bending up and I'm two fingers are grabbing the double stop and then the pick is coming across. And when it gets to a certain speed, it's just everything gets choked and it gets muted. Oh, good. I'm glad that answered your question. So, you know, it's a cool sound. So sometimes it's, it's I'm leaning on it too. But that lick, if you want to hear James do it, if you listen to the solo on um, uh, Ooh Las Vegas, um, and I think the fills leading into his solo. So maybe it's the, the verse right before his guitar solo. He does. 
He does a couple, you know, you got to remember James is playing with a thumb pick uh, and, and a banjo pick. So, like, it's a lot easier to go. That is, that's something else that he does that's really cool. Sounds like Twilight Zone when you play it really slow. But, um, you know, starting with, like, G and B here. I'm in E right now. But starting with G and B grabbing the double stop, and then the pick is coming across to pay, play the G-sharp. A little sloppy at the end there, but you get the idea. Um, all right, so, guys, if you haven't checked out that course, um, the Survival Guide, I'd love for you to check it out um, and hit me up with questions about that stuff because there's so much in there that I would love to do, you know, lives on and and um and you know open this up so you guys can ask questions about because that course came out so long ago and uh you know people are still hitting me up about it and I figure this is a good opportunity for us to actually kind of go in depth and talk about stuff um and then uh you know uh the uh discount code I, i'm sure phil mentioned it here but it's double 25 you get 25 percent off of that course and then all the tabs and the new backing track for it, which is way more fun to solo over than that old thing that had the uh, metronome come in after every solo is up there also for you to grab. So, um, you know, go ahead and take that. And uh, yeah, I'll answer just a couple more questions. And I think we're going to go here. But um, man, uh, so nice you guys all to drop in. And I hope you were digging this. Kind of flew through this one a little bit and, you know, got a little sidetrack. I'll, I'll be a little more focused next time. But um, let's see here. Do I, uh, Dave, do I scratch with the pick fingers or both scratch? Ooh, I don't know what you mean by that, man. Um, hmm. So do I scratch with the picker fingers? Um, basically, just to break it down, what I'm doing with chicken picking is... Um, with the fingers, I'm trying to grab the strings hard enough to get them to smack against the frets. So that's one part of it. Is... So getting that really choked kind of sound from the string hitting the, the frets. And then with the pick, um, I'm not really doing anything too different with the pick. It, you know, wh where the sound is different is in that left hand with the releasing tension and getting the muting sound. If I take away all those... It's all those little muted uh, pick strokes that make everything sound syncopated because you know, where a note normally would be, you're getting just this muted pick stroke. And then, you know, you're getting this other note that's on a, emphasizing a beat that you normally wouldn't emphasize. And that's kind of what makes, one of the many things that makes, you know, that technique pretty cool. Uh, let's see here, I'll do one more. And then, uh, then we'll call it. Um, let's see. No, I'm sure I missed. I'm sure I missed a bunch here. Um, first, I just like I want to thank everybody. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Doyle, for saying something. Um, you know, all the questions are great. Thanks, Dave. Music shop. Thanks for dropping in. Oh yes. Oh, I see. You're trying to clarify your question from before. But yes, on an open string. What do I do? Good question. What do you do on an open string? So for muting. I have to use the hand if I'm going to mute on an open string. Or I'm just quickly grabbing the note with my finger. So I'm plucking plucking the note with the finger and then placing the finger right back so I can't speak. And that's where what I was talking to you guys before about, about making sure that these were a unit and you weren't wasting a lot of motion. That's where that's going to help you because you can get back to the string faster if you're not far away from it all right all right guys and gals um thank you all for checking in and uh this was fun i'll see you next week and uh you know hit me up if you have suggestions of course 
Um, you know where to find me. You can get me through my website or you can get me through Facebook. A um, couple things to check out. Uh, all this month, like I said, I'm going to be doing all those videos for UA. And even if you don't own um, the UA Apollo, you could win one. But even if you don't own one, I'm just going into a lot of details with how to use compressor plugins, how to use delay plugins, how to use um, room tone, uh, reverb. Um, I got some new ones coming out um, that are going to go through signal chains for country, a great country guitar sound, signal chain for a great jazz guitar sound, rock guitar sound. Um, so there's, you know, I think there's things to grab in there for, for anyone. Um, and if you haven't entered in that contest to win stuff, win stuff, um, go get it, man. Cause their stuff is really great and it does make recording at home much more fun, especially if you're like me and you live in, you know, New York and you can't crank amps in your apartment all the time. And you're doing a lot of, you know, lessons or taking lessons or giving lessons or, um, you know, whatever it is, or doing things like this, you know, I'm just going direct through an amp modeler and plugins right in a signal chain to get in, to get this guitar sound. So it makes a lot of this stuff sound so much better than it normally would. Um, and so much easier to manage with, you know, the new world that we live in here. Um, all right. So I think that's going to be it. Everybody take care, have a great week and I will see you next week. And, uh, you know, make sure you thank Phil again and be sure to check out Jeff Mackerlane's uh, live on Saturday. I'm sure Phil will help us out with whoever the guest is. I don't know who Jeff has on uh, this Saturday, but I'm sure it's somebody great. He always has somebody great on. Um, and then on Thursday is also, I think Corey goes on around like two o'clock doing a YouTube live. That's pretty fun. I've been dropping in there. And um, Jeff is also doing one on Wednesday at uh, 4 o'clock. That's pretty good. Um, you know, so come by. Say hello. All right. I'll see you guys soon. All the best.